and welcome to this video on periodicity. Um, this video is particularly for AQA. Uh, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and basically this video is for revision purposes to give you an overview of the periodicity topic. Um, the PowerPoints that I'm going to be using here, the ones that I've made, uh, can be uh, purchased from uh, for well for your use you can use it for revision you can print them off etc so if you find uh, the link in the description box below this video you can click that link and you can uh, you can access them there um, like I say these videos are specifically for uh, the AQA specification um, so you can see that we've taken the bits from the spec to make sure that it fits um, with what you need so they're pretty targeted to your exam board if you're studying the AQA syllabus okay so let's make a start so periodicity is obviously to do with the periodic table we're looking at trends there's a lot of trends here and descriptions and some really um, important keywords really for this topic it's really important so basically we need to know how the elements are arranged in the periodic table so the elements are ordered by proton number not mass number okay it's really 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 important that you don't write down that there was in terms of mass number and um, it's always proton number so proton number is obviously the number uh, the smaller number on the period table tells you the number of protons groups are columns so these go down and the elements in the same group they have the same number of electrons in their outer shell so group one have one electron group two have two electrons etc so that's what we're seeing there so group two elements have two electrons in their outer shell and that relates to the uh, group number as well so elements in the same group they have similar properties so for example all the group one elements here they react violently with water you might have seen this when you put them into a big trough of water uh, and they explode they produce hydrogen um, yeah they're pretty reactive so um, and they basically react with increasing vigor as we go down the group so I mean I wouldn't want to know exactly what happens with francium but uh, I wouldn't be standing next to it put it that way so it'll be really really violent whereas lithium doesn't react as much um, periods or rows this is going across this is really important because this topic is all about periodicity so we're going to do a lot of that in here uh, elements in the same period they have the same number of electron shells so elements for example in this period they all have four electron shells okay and this one this one will have three this one will have two and that one will have one so that's very important okay these ones are known as s block elements so which are these ones in um in the red basically their highest electron or the electron furthest from the nucleus occupies the s orbital these ones are known as p block elements so this group here and there's um they come in bunches of six and the purple lot are known as d block elements they have electrons that occupy the highest electron um in the highest energy level they they occupy the d block okay and these are known as f block elements so as long as you know the the different blocks okay let's look at atomic radii so as we go across period three uh the radius decreases it gets marginally smaller as you can see there okay now you need to know um obviously this trend in terms of atomic radius you can see obviously here's the data to actually show it this is the atomic radius remember obviously atoms are really small so this is measured in nanometers and you can see it generally decreases okay so there's an increased nuclear charge as we go across here in other words we've got more protons in the nucleus this pulls in the electrons um, in the shell but crucially the um that's what we're saying there so it's pulling close towards the nucleus but very importantly you've obviously got this shielding effect that's very similar now shielding is the um basically the protection of inner electron shells from the nucleus so because the shielding is pretty similar across this period here we're not entering any new shells then the um, increased nuclear charge or the increased number of protons does have an effect and it just pulls in them outer electrons a little bit more okay so you need to be able to describe that okay so the atomic radius increases down groups so when we go down a group down here the atomic radius increases we've got extra electron shells basically as we go down this group here and um, so the um the atomic radius increases so therefore the removal of electron becomes easier but we'll look at that later okay melting points right so the first three elements these ones here sodium magnesium and aluminium uh, in period three are metals and so they all have metallic bonding there's a an example of metallic bonding this is for sodium uh, it has a, a positive charge obviously the positive metal ion in the middle and the electrons obviously surrounding it 
Um, if you look for magnesium, magnesium has got a two plus charge and two electrons in here. Now this is gonna have a much bigger attractive force, electrostatic attraction between the two plus and the negative electrons. Okay, so basically there's a general increase in melting points as the met lines have an increased positive charge, more delocalized electrons, therefore um, we have a stronger metallic bond, increased electrostatic attraction between these. So that's why magnesium's got a higher melting point. Um, okay, so if we look at um, the next one, which is silicon, okay? So silicon is uh, much, much higher compared to the rest of them. So it must have some kind of special type of bonding. Um, and it does to an extent. It's a giant covalent structure. Um, it's macromolecular. These are huge structures. There's an example here. This is diamond, um, but silicon forms the similar structure here. Um, many strong covalent bonds. Look at all the covalent bonds there. These are the blue lines. These hold in this case, silicon atoms together, loads of energy is required to overcome these strong covalent bonds. This is the type of words you need to be using when describing why silicon has a high melting point. Carbon, for example, like diamond, can be um, explained in the same way as well. Okay, next one, now phosphorus. This is this element down here. So phosphorus is the formula P4, okay? Bit unusual, you have to know about that much lower melting point compared to silicon, not macromolecular, this is called simple molecular, so it's very small molecules, and the melting point is actually determined by van der Waals forces, which are a lot weaker than these many strong covalent bonds that you have in silicon. So the melting point is now determined by van der Waals. Here we're talking about breaking bonds, okay? Here we're talking about van der Waals. So phosphorus is P4. It rises marginally, for sulfur, okay? You need to be able to explain this. Sulfur is S8, as you can see here. It's like in an octagon shape, okay? Higher melting point because it's a slightly bigger molecule compared to phosphorus. So because it's a slightly bigger molecule, it has larger van der Waals forces, and therefore it has a higher melting point. So that's why it's slightly higher there. Chlorine dips a bit. So we're gonna look at the next one. Here's chlorine, very small, only two of them, it's not as big as S8, it's only Cl2, much lower melting point, simple molecular again, smaller van der Waals forces, much lower, and again, it drops again for argon, argon is literally just on its own, it doesn't bond with anything, smaller again, lower melting point, so um, therefore, um, it only exists on its own, we call it monoatomic, uh, much smaller van der Waals, lower melting point. Okay, so as long as you can describe them trends and link it with structure, that's the main thing. Okay, ionization. Okay, this is really important. Again, this is where I said right at the start about the keywords. Keywords are king in this thing, especially for ionization. Okay, so ionization energy is the minimum amount of energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state. Okay, you've got to know them uh, certain keywords. Okay, so here's the example. Here's one sodium going to Na plus plus an electron. The first ionization is plus. 495.8 kilojoules per mole. Always include your state symbols. That's really important. And the ionization requires energy. You are removing an electron from an atom. So you have to put energy in to do that. And that's why these things are always positively charged. So these are effectively like endothermic processes. Okay. Now the key thing here is shielding. Shielding is the protective, um, uh, the protection of uh, inner electron shells from the nucleus to the outer electron. So basically, um, the more electron shells between the positive nucleus and the outer electron um, that is being removed, the less energy is required because there is a weaker attraction. This has more shielding compared to that. Okay, so the atomic size is also quite important as well. This is a bigger atom compared to that. Bigger atoms means bigger distance between positive nucleus and outer electron. Electrons are lost more readily with atoms that are bigger than compared with the ones which are smaller. The attractive force is obviously weaker for bigger atoms. And the nuclear charge, the more protons in the nucleus, the bigger the attraction is. Um, this means it takes more energy to remove the electron. Um, but however, this is, as we go down groups, this is overridden by shielding. Um, so shielding has a much bigger impact, even though we might have more protons in the nucleus as we go down the group, shielding has a much bigger impact on ionization than nuclear charge. This is mainly relevant when we go across a period. 
Okay, so we need to look at successive ionization. So the removal of more than one electron from the same atom is called successive ionization. So here it is here, magnesium plus to magnesium two plus plus an electron. So the second ionization energy, this is the removal of the second electron, is plus one four five zero kilojoules per mole. Okay. Now you see we've got these jumps here. So this is the removal of the uh, of an electron from the same atom. So this is obviously this is going to be in magnesium. So you see we've got two jumps. This is because we're removing electrons from a shell that's much closer to the nucleus, and that's going to take a little bit more energy than what it would if it was much nearer. Okay, so we're going to start with um, looking at the general trend. Like I say, it increases um, generally. It takes more energy because we're moving electrons from something that's increasingly more positive, and it's getting closer to the nucleus. Start with this lot first. The first two electrons in magnesium in the outer shell sit in the 3s orbital, and you can see these two here. Okay, relatively easy to remove. Then we've got this big jump. This is because we're having to remove electrons from the 2p and 2s um, suborbitals. Okay, so we're just going to put them in there. That's them ones there. Much closer to the nucleus, these ones are. Imagine the nucleus is down here, closer to the nucleus, so therefore it requires a lot more energy to remove them. Then it jumps again because we're having to remove electrons from the 1s orbital, which is very close to the nucleus. So that takes a lot more energy to do. Okay, so we know this is magnesium because we're removing 12 electrons. All right, okay. First ionization energy. So this is um, looking at groups this time. So ionization energy decreases as we go down a group. It's easier to remove an electron as we go down a group. This one, we're gonna look at group two. So this is because the atomic radius as we go down the group increases. So the outer electrons are further from the nucleus and this means the attractive force is a lot weaker. So we don't need as much energy to remove that outer electron. Okay. Also, as we go down the group, like I said before, the shielding increases. Shielding is really, really important. More shielding, more shells between the nucleus, positive nucleus and the outer electron. That means the attractive force is weaker and that means less energy is required to remove that outer electron to ionize it. So ionization energy decreases as we go down the group. Uh, and again, um, you need to obviously know about the um, the uh, the historical aspects of the development of the atom. And Niels Bohr basically came up with a shell theory, and this model proves it. Um, however, it doesn't explain data shown going across a period, and that's where the modern subshell or suborbital um, theory comes from. So let's have a look at that. So this is going across a period. So this is the ionization energy increases as we go across the period so you can see here there's the general increase because we've got more protons in the nucleus um, it requires a little bit more energy to remove that electron um, because you've got an increased nuclear attraction um, and the shielding crucially going across is actually pretty similar so it doesn't really have much of an impact here um, the obviously increase in number of protons does Okay, so more energy is required to remove the outer electron. So generally, as we go across the um, uh, across the period, uh, the ionization energy increases. Okay, now you notice there's a few exceptions here. Okay, so we have a decrease at aluminium, and this is evidence for atoms having subshells, which is what we mentioned before. Okay, so the outermost electron in aluminium actually sits in a higher energy subshell. Than, and it's slightly further from the nucleus than for in magnesium. Okay, so let's have a look at them here. So this is for aluminium, and you can see that its outer electron sits in the 3p1 subshell. That's slightly further away from the nucleus, it's slightly shielded from the 3s. Okay, so that's it there. But if we have a look at magnesium, magnesium has its outer electron in the 3s subshell. So the atomic model that Niels Bohr came up with didn't actually explain this subshell theory. Um, he only just looked at shells, um, but obviously the modern one is looking at subshells. Okay, so that's for aluminium. So it's slightly shielded from this one here, so it requires a little bit uh, less energy for aluminium because of the shielding effect. Okay, uh, if we look at next one along, which is sulfur. Now, sulfur is a little bit um, strange in this one okay so basically we've got a decrease of sulfur as evidence for electron repulsion this time so we're not talking about distance from the the nucleus because obviously this is in the same um, p subshell so we're not moving into any new subshell here so if you look at phosphorus 
Okay, so phosphorus and sulfur both have outer electrons in the 3p orbital. Okay, so this is an energy level diagram for sulfur, but phosphorus would just have one electron there and this one wouldn't be there. So the shielding is actually the same. So the shielding is not an issue here. Okay, but if we're trying to remove this electron here, this is the electrical configuration for sulfur, and we're trying to remove it from an orbital that has two electrons in already. Okay. Um, now, electrons repel each other because they have the same charge. So if they're repelling each other, it means you're not going to need that much energy to take an electron away um, because it doesn't want to be there anyway. It's repelling the other electron. So less energy is needed to remove an electron from an orbital which has two in it. Um, phosphorus only has one, so therefore you're going to need a little bit more energy to remove this one because there's no electron repulsion. But to remove this electron... It won't take too much effort because there's repulsion there anyway. And this is why there's a slight drop in sulfur compared to with phosphorus. And so that is periodicity. Um, it's relatively straightforward. A lot of trends there. The key things really are shielding, nuclear charge, atomic radius. Comment on all of them in your answers. These are normally worth about three marks in the exam. So make sure you're using them properly. Uh, and again, if you um, want to see this PowerPoint or if you want to use the PowerPoint for your own use, um, you can find the link. You can purchase it. Um, you can find the link in the description box of this video. Uh, if you just click on that and it will take you to the place where you can, um, where you can buy it. Um, but um, that's it for now. Bye bye.